So good morning, Freedom. It's so great to spend some time with you on this Sunday morning. Uh, I know that a lot of you are away on kids camp, and uh, those guys are actually having uh, their service on kids camp that Tony is leading at just about the same time as we're sharing and meeting together this morning. And so we just think about the guys on kids camp and we offer them our thoughts and prayers. You might be a little surprised to see me here. You were probably expecting to see Daryl. Daryl's picked up a little bit of a bug. It's nothing too serious, we hope, uh, but it has meant that he needs to take a little bit of time to recover, and so I'm going to be filling in for Daryl today. And I wonder if, we, at the same time that we're thinking about the guys who are away on kids' camp today, if we could just spare some thoughts and prayers for Daryl as well. And so today, the topic of the sermon is the truth. And by way of introduction, as I was preparing for this, I just thought of a a funny story that I thought I would share with you. A little while ago at my daughter's preschool, the teachers had this great idea that uh, they would spoil the moms for Mother's Day. And so what they arranged is that they would give each of the children a questionnaire to fill in all about the things that they like about their mum. And one of the questions on the questionnaire was, what does my mum like and the idea was that the moms would be invited to tea and the responses to the questions would be shared with the moms and it was uh, all going to be very cute and it was Uh, everything was going swimmingly until they got to one of the last responses uh, on one of the last questionnaires and uh, the first part was great mom was lovely she gave the best hugs all good until we got to what mom liked best and apparently what this mom liked best above everything else was wine. And as you can imagine, that had caused a few blushes and uh, mom was a bit red-faced. But the reason that I'm sharing that uh, story with you is just to illustrate the point that the truth always comes out. So one of the reasons I think that we need to speak about the truth and why this talk is so important is because the devil is a liar. In fact, We read in John 8 um, this very fact. Before we get to that, just to give you some context, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees on this occasion. Now, the Pharisees were the Jewish teachers of the law, and they would be uh, the people in uh, Jewish society at that time who would be the custodians um, of the truth. And what we read in John 8, verse 44, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, is he says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he, al- when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so when we understand this about the devil, It should come as no surprise when we look at the world around us that the truth is very hard to come by. And we may be inclined to think that this is a recent occurrence and it's only been like this, uh, you know, since the rise of the internet or perhaps uh, since social media uh, was invented. But in fact, it's always been um, like this. The devil is a mortal enemy of the truth. As far back as Genesis 3, We read the account of the fall, and in verse 13 of that chapter, we read this exchange between God and Eve. Then God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So just to be clear, when it speaks about the serpent in Genesis 3, it's speaking about the devil. And so we see that right from the very beginning, right in the Garden of Eden, right from the time of Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, the devil's tactic has been to deceive us and to lie to us. What I will say about the rise of social media and the internet and all of the modern, you know, kind of contrivances that we currently have 
is that the devil's plan is to lie to us. And social media um, is used by the devil to amplify his lies. Whereas God's word, God's word, the Bible, amplifies his truth. And so with the truth hard to come by, it might be worthwhile to take a look at what we mean by the truth. And the starting point, perhaps, would be to look at what the dictionary definition of the truth is. In the dictionary definition uh, by Miriam Webster's, we see that the truth is the body of real events, things, and facts. Now, you may think that this definition would seem uncontroversial, and that there's not too much to say there that could be open to debate. But since the rise of Donald Trump even, what we have called facts have come under fire. In defending several demonstrably false claims made by his press secretary, Donald Trump's counselor at the time stated that the claims weren't false, but rather they were based on alternate facts. Now what we have to realize here, and I think it's important to underline, is that there are no such thing as alternate facts. There are only facts and lies. Now these attempts to divert our attention from the truth are not new either. And in fact, when we read uh, the word in Colossians 2 verse 4, we receive there a warning not to be deceived by fine-sounding arguments, but to hold to the truth. And so the devil offers us fine-sounding arguments, whereas Jesus offers us the truth. And so it would seem that even the dictionary definition of the truth has fallen out of favor. And in many conversations, what we hear reference to instead of the truth are references to my truth or your truth. Maybe you want me to unpack that a little bit. So speaking about my truth or your truth suggests that truth is relative to the individual. Philosophers call this view truth relativism. And you never thought that philosophy was going to be of any use to you ever, right? And here it is being used to wage war on you every single day. When somebody makes this claim that the truth is relative, then what is made true or false is made true or false by what they believe or how they feel rather than the world actually is. So many thanks to the University of Waikato and to Jeremy White in particular for clearing that up for me. See, when you're preparing for your preach, uh, you learn stuff. Now this conversation is very prevalent in our society at the moment. It's influenced even conversations about identity and gender and things of that nature. Sexuality, all of these are influenced currently by truth relativism. That's a whole preach for another day, and I don't want to get into that uh, too much. But here's what I do want to say. Is if you feel like you don't know what the truth is on, this, on these issues, can I invite you to seek what Jesus has to say um, on these issues? There are so many of these messages about, um, in order to be authentic, we need to live our truth. We need to follow our hearts and feelings in order to be true to ourselves. And when we do that, then we are living our best lives. And sadly, this is particularly prevalent in children's stories and shows. So what we get presented with in a lot of these uh, shows is that we have this brave protagonist. And when I was preparing for this, I was told that I can't use the word protagonist. I need to use the word hero. And that is because protagonist is maybe a bit of a technical term. But you get the brave hero who is an outcast because he or she won't follow the rules. And he takes the decision to live his or her truth. He needs to follow, he or she needs to follow her heart. And then there's this moment in the story where things fall apart because the brave hero or heroine has made this brave decision to follow their heart. And everything falls apart. But then the story arc changes again. 
and they are restored. And everything is better because they followed their hearts. They followed their truths. Okay. This is dangerous for a number of reasons, but particularly in children's shows and things like that, we have to remember that the people who are following their hearts don't even, in uh, a lot of cases, have fully developed prefrontal cortexes. That means that the part of your brain, which is essential for long-term decision-making, hasn't doesn't even exist yet. But now we need to follow our hearts. What a stupid idea. No wonder, no wonder the world looks like it does. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a rant, but uh, I'm passionate. <laughs> in Jeremiah, speaking about following your heart, in Jeremiah 17, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? If that is true, why are we telling people to follow their hearts? If we are to live our truth, our truth, my truth, this relative truth, one of the consequences is that the truth is always changing because how I feel is always changing. How I feel about this topic might change uh, from day to day. And if we have to, if we believe what it says in the Word, what that also means is the truth is hard to know because if the truth is based on what's in my heart and my heart is hard to know, I will never know what the truth is. I wonder today if you know the truth. I wonder if sitting there today, you've had a week, I'm sure, where you've been receiving messages, I think the, the statistics off the charts, but it's thousands and thousands and thousands of messages that we get through our cell phones and through the internet and through social media and everything like that. We're bombarded with these messages. And there's so much information out there. But do you, as you sit there today, know which of those are true and which of those can be relied on? I know sometimes I don't. I don't know what to believe one way or another often. So what do Christ followers believe about truth? To find that out, we again turn to Scripture and to the Gospel of John. And we're looking at John 14, verse 6. And if you're there, Jesus is speaking. So in my Bible, these words are read. And that's how we know that these are the words that Jesus says. And he says these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really want to know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. I am the way the truth, and the life. For Christians, Jesus is the truth. A friend of mine used to say that any sincere quest for the truth will eventually lead you to Jesus. I think that if we take a look at what uh, Jesus says in John, I agree with that statement. If you sincerely cheat, uh, seek the truth, it doesn't matter where your starting point is, you will eventually end at Jesus. The problem that we have is that we get distracted along the way. So we start out at one point, sincerely seeking the truth, and we get distracted by the first convenient lie that comes along, and we settle for that. If we truly seek the truth and keep on that journey, eventually you have to come to Jesus. He is the truth. So when we want to know the truth, we turn to Jesus, not to social media, not to our feelings, not to our own understanding. We turn to Jesus. In John 8 verse 31, Jesus is speaking again, and what he says, that if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you so maybe just to say that how do we hold on to Jesus' teaching? How do we do that practically? What is it that we need to do to hold to Jesus' teaching so that we can know what the truth is? 
quite simple. We do what he says. Jesus, a number of times in the scriptures, 50, 60, 70, numbers of times in the, in the scriptures, says, I tell you the truth, and then he lays the truth down uh, in the Bible. If you want to know the truth, you have to do what he says. Now, you can't do what he says if you don't know what he says. And so we have to get into the word. We have to be diligent about finding out what Jesus actually says and not just stopping there. We actually have to do what he says. When we do that, we will know the truth. There's so much to unpack in that scripture. I just love that last line though. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The first thing to know or the first thing to take note of, is if that is that if we hold to Jesus' teachings, we can know the truth. If you're feeling confused, you don't know what the truth is, you're struggling with identity, you're struggling to know how it is that you fit in uh, at school, you're struggling to know how you fit into God's kingdom, what his plan is, or anything like that, you're confused because the devil is lying to you. You can know the truth. You can know it. Right at the beginning of the year, we received an invitation to make 2024 the year that we get to know Jesus better. John 8 tells us how to do that. Hold to my teachings. Then you will know the truth. If Jesus is the truth, then when we know the truth, we know Jesus. And the truth will set you free. The other thing to note is that there is good news. There is good news in that scripture. And if you're wondering whether you should follow the truth of Jesus, there's a powerful incentive. The truth will set you free. And so these two in the scriptures are always quite closely linked. Jesus speaks about truth and he speaks about freedom. And so perhaps if we are talking about truth, we also need to unpack a little bit about what Jesus is saying about freedom. And maybe it's a good idea to contrast that with what the world is saying about freedom. Because the devil's not, uh, the devil knows what it is that Jesus is offering. He's offering the truth and freedom. If he wants to deceive us, he needs to offer us something that looks like the truth and also looks like freedom. So what is it that he is offering? Now, if you look up what freedom means, most often you get something like the condition or right of being able or allowed to do, say, or think whatever you want to without being controlled or limited. But the operative part that we get in social media and when we look at the world around us is just focused on that last part without being controlled or limited. And so there are slogans and things like that that we see on t-shirts, live without limits, because that's what it means to be free. To be free means to live without limits. Just to be clear, that's a Jeep slogan. That's not actually what it says in the Bible. (laughs) Parents understand a little bit about limits. The limits that we place on our children are not there to make them slaves. They are there to protect them. And you know that without looking at the word. Because the world actually works like that. Now false freedom looks like freedom and it sounds like freedom and it tastes like freedom. But it is not freedom. In most cases, living without limits leads us to profound bondage. The extreme case there is that living without limits will see you arrested. How free are you after you're living in prison and can get to go out one hour every 24 to walk around in a courtyard before you're back in a cell? That is eventually where living without limits gets us. But even if you manage to avoid going to jail, living without limits will eventually lead you to bondage in some form. Like many messages we receive from the devil, the message we receive about freedom Looks almost right. 
So what is it? What do we uh, hear in the word about freedom and about living without limits? In 1 Corinthians 10, and at verse 23, we read the following. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That's not quite the same as live without limits. What that says is you can do anything you like. But not everything that you do is such a smashing idea. A friend of mine uh, often says that we're free to choose and do whatever we like to do. But we can never choose the consequences of our actions or our decisions. Do whatever you like. But you cannot escape forever the consequences of your choices. That's what they don't tell you when they say, live without limits. Now there are a few things to understand about the freedom that the devil offers us. In order to understand what he's offering, we first need to understand his purpose. So why is it that the devil is offering us anything? Surely the devil just wants to take. What is it that he wants from us? Once again, we turn to the scriptures. John 10. I know there are a lot of scriptures in this, uh, in this preach today. I know that. But there is a very specific reason for that. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But if we're speaking about the truth, and we're not speaking about the scriptures, then we're on very dangerous ground. In John 10, and at verse 10, we read the following. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life to the full. The thief there is the devil. Once we realize that the devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy, then immediately we understand that he wants us to be free in the same way that a cat wants a budgie to be free from its cage. The budgie is free for 10 seconds, and then it's dinner. That is the freedom that the devil is offering. You are mad if you make that decision to follow that freedom. Worse than being mad, you are dead if you follow that, uh, that freedom. Now, you only have to look at the world to understand that living without limits doesn't, need, doesn't lead to freedom. But if you need an example of what it's like to live without limits, you need only look at the life of King Solomon. So who is King Solomon? King Solomon was the son of David, and he was one of the kings of Israel. He wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. And what we know about uh, Solomon is he was the original rock star party animal uh, that we can find in, in the scriptures. He may have inspired a whole generation of rock stars um, after that. He was fabulously wealthy. He had hundreds of wives uh, and concubines. And he literally made it his mission to do precisely whatever it was that he wanted to do in his life. Keith Richards, from the, the lead guitarist from the Rolling Stones, he would have been very at home at Solomon's parties. You don't know who Keith Switches is? Ask your mom. <laughs> so we read in Ecclesiastes, in it, and in particular in Ecclesiastes 2, and it will be up on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase the important bits. Solomon says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure and find out what is good. Later on he says, I tried cheering myself with wine. I amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. Provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem, again, ask your mom, as well as the delights of a man's heart. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired, and I refused my heart no pleasure. And yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, and nothing was gained under the sun.
In fact, at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes 12, we read at thir- verse 13, Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. So Solomon is looking back over this life of excess, where he has denied himself no pleasure. If he felt like doing it, he did it. He's now looking back at his life and evaluating it. And here he says, is what I've learned. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Another way of saying keep his commandments is hold to his teaching. I wonder where we've heard that before. Didn't Jesus say that? And didn't we hear that just a couple of minutes ago? For this is the duty of all mankind. And so after all of that excess and living without limits, Solomon ends up right back where Jesus says to hold to his teachings. Now this week I know that the devil has been whispering to you. He's been lying to you. How do I know that? Because that's what the devil does. The devil lies to you all day, every day. Maybe you haven't realized it, but now you do. The devil is lying to you. While you're sitting here now, the devil is lying to you. Hopefully not through me. (laughs) One of the reasons that I know that is because that has been his plan right from the beginning. The same way that the devil lied to Eve in the garden, he's lying to you now. Now, how do we deal with this? How do we... The devil is lying to us. He's telling us all of these untruths. It's going to end up in bondage for us. So how do we defend ourselves? How do we actually practically deal with this bombardment that we are under? And we get a great example of how to deal with this, actually in the life of Jesus. You turn in your Bibles to Matthew 4. There's this exchange that happens. And just to place it in the context in in Jesus' story, Jesus has just been baptized in the River Jordan. Holy Spirit has come down like a dove, and he's removed immediately to the desert to be alone. And he spends that time in prayer and fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And while he's there, the tempter, who's the devil, comes to him. And on each occasion that the devil comes to him, he offers him a little lie. Looks right, sounds right. And in some instances, It looks like it even comes out of Scripture. And the devil comes to Jesus. And so first he says to him, tell these stones to become bread. And look how Jesus responds. Jesus answers, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So where did Jesus get that? That is from the Scriptures. That's where it is written. The devil offers Jesus a little lie, and Jesus counters it with the word. Later, the the devil comes to Jesus again and says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. The devil is cunning. That particular uh, phrase that he's using there actually comes out of the Word. It actually comes out of the Scriptures. But Jesus, who really knows what it says in the Word, counters again. And he says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so once again, the devil offers a little lie. Jesus offers, uh, counters with the word. And the last thing that the devil does, his last roll of the dice, is he takes Jesus to a very high mountain and shows him all of the kingdoms of the world. And he says to them, all of this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. When we understand uh, that Jesus is God made flesh, the devil over here seems to be trying to tempt Jesus with something that he already has, which is a curious strategy to be sure. But how does Jesus answer? He says to him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so there we see it. We have the lie, 
and the devil, and Jesus counsels with the scriptures. In Hebrews 4, it says the following, at verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Now, didn't we read, read earlier that it's difficult to know what's on our hearts? Who can know our hearts? Our heart is deceitful above all things. And here in the scriptures we learn how we can know what it is that is on our hearts by getting into the Word. The Word will help us to discern the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Now we need to be clear. Every single day, even as you're sitting here, there is a battle that is raging for your soul. And you say, well, I don't want to fight any kind of battle. I'm quite happy just to put my head in the sand and just see how it all works out. That doesn't stop you from becoming a casualty. And in fact, that approach only gets us into more trouble. We have to take up the sword if we are to have any chance um, against the lies of the devil. We have to get into the word. We have to come to Jesus. We have to know his truth. And when we do that, then we have a fighting chance. So what are some of the things that the devil says to us? There are so many. And oh, geez, like this, just... Some of the rubbish that comes to us on a daily basis could be, you know, sermons until the end of the year. But I just want to pick up on maybe three that seem to be very, very loud um, at the moment. The first is that the devil is telling us constantly that we are worthless. Maybe you've heard that message this week. Maybe it's come to you through social media. Maybe it's come to you from somebody that you love. Maybe it's come to you from a friend. Maybe it was said in the heat of a moment, but it's stuck and it hurts. And you've received that message. You've heard that lie, that you are worthless. Can I offer you the truth? It says in Isaiah, That God's truth is that you are precious to Him. Precious to Him. Sometimes God whispers that, and we often speak in church about the still small voice. God is whispering, I love you, I love you, I love you. And sometimes that voice gets drowned out. Because the big lie, the social media, everything like that seems to be seems to be drowning it out. There are times in Scripture, though, when God stops whispering and He shouts at you through a megaphone. It's Easter in just a few weeks. If you haven't heard yet that Jesus loves you, can I take this opportunity to show you that Jesus loves you? So much that he was prepared to die on a cross so that you could have a relationship with him. At some point in the scriptures, God stopped speaking in a whisper. No longer was he prepared to be drowned out by the lies of the devil. At some point in history, he takes up a megaphone to say, I love you in a way That will never be silenced. And he does that on the cross. If you've heard that truth or that truth from the world that you are worthless, please let me tell you that that is a lie. Maybe what you have been hearing this week is that God has forgotten about you. You've been following him and the heavens have turned to brass. And no matter how much you seek him, he has forgotten about you and you can never have a relationship with him. That is a lie. 
The truth is that God will never forget you. And we read in the Word that even if a mother forgets her baby, still God will never forget about us. In Revelation we read that our names are engraved onto the palms of His hands. Whatever your situation is, wherever it is, no matter how far removed you are from God, He has not forgotten about you. And he is seeking a relationship with you. We read in the word that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us daily, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You, by name, the Holy Spirit is interceding with the Father on your behalf. God hasn't forgotten about you. That is a lie. Please don't accept that lie. Lastly, maybe you've been hearing this week that you can never be forgiven. Maybe you've stuffed up and you've been cancelled. Maybe you think that you can never be forgiven. This is particularly prevalent at the moment in cancel culture. For those of you who are not familiar with what cancel culture is, that it's this phenomenon that's uh, kind of developed whereby social media uh, personalities or artists or movie stars will say something uh, in a public space that somebody doesn't agree with or offends them or whatever the case may be. And what happens is that there's an online boycott uh, of uh, these people. So if you've got a social media account, all of a sudden all your followers are gone uh, if you're a music artist, nobody's buying your albums, and there's a boycott, which is targeted mostly at destroying this person's career. But it's not just social media people that have this happen to them. A lot of our kids and a lot of us live our lives mostly online. And we attach a large part of our self-worth and things like that to how many likes, or follows, or friend requests, or whatever it is that we have on Facebook, or whatever it is, Instagram, TikTok. You do something, you say something, and the next morning you wake up, and all of a sudden everybody's unfriended you. Nobody wants to uh, return your uh, messages. Nobody's liking your content anymore, uh, and you're a social media pariah. You have been cancelled. Now that can be particularly bewildering for kids who are still forming their identities, who are still trying to find out where it is in the world, who have this need for community and things like that, and have this community, and all of a sudden that community is gone by quicksand. And in that situation, there's no way off of the rubbish heap. There's no way, there's no way out of the garbage. Once you've been cancelled, that's it. That's forever. That is your destiny. That is your punishment for for stuffing up. And you will never um, get out of that situation. God never cancels us. God never cancels us. What we read in the Word is that He is forgiving, good, and abounding in love. And that once our sins are forgiven, he no longer remembers them. That is scriptural. It says that in the Bible, that once you have been forgiven of your sins, God doesn't even remember that they took place. Please don't think that I'm saying now that there are no consequences for your actions, because there are. If you're in a car crash and it was your fault, you may be forgiven for that, but you still have to go to hospital and you still have to go through the, the pain and the trauma of rehab and everything like that. You may have to have follow-up surgeries and everything like that. But the fact that you might have been drunk driving or anything like that, God forgets that. But the consequences of our actions remain. Okay. But the message here is clear. If you are hearing this week that you can never be forgiven for what it is that you have done, God's truth is that he is forgiving, good, abounding in love, and that once our sins are forgiven, 
he never remembers them again. And once again, such a great time of year to have a message like this because if you are hearing that message again, look at the cross. Whosoever believeth in him. Whosoever believeth in him except those that have done the following will be saved. No, there's no caveat there. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. And so I don't know... uh, I don't know what it is that the devil is whispering in your ear this week. I don't know what lies he's telling you. I don't know what's being shouted at you through social media. I don't know what it is, what message it is that you are hearing this week. But I know that he's lying to you. And whatever he's telling you, won't you seek the truth? And when you do know that that truth, when you eventually find it, will set you free. Amen.